uh, our talk today is going to be about how to use risk in the real world. Uh, we're going to show a step-by-step -step example of a point-to-point -point video transmission. Uh, more specifically, uh, we're going to show how to uh, perform a narrow free transmission of a 4K 30 megabits per second video stream using Libris and the Libris tools over a network that has emulated packet loss, packet corruption, and packet reordering. So in today's world, you know, a 1080p video of video feed over HLS or Dash is good enough for, you, for you know, a, any home user. Tomorrow, the same user will demand 4K quality at lower latencies, right? So uh, in order to accomplish this, uh, Every company must deal with the challenge of developing efficient and easy to use GUIs, you know, user interfaces, and they also need to uh, use a combination of open standards like RIST uh, to guarantee interoperability and free open source software engines are typically part of the solution as well. In this case, we're showing uh, how to use Librist, a full-blown open source uh, uh, project that uh, you know, we maintain. This is a point to point link. In both cases, cases the standard Librist open source tools called RIS, sender, and RIS receiver are going to be used. On the receiver side, we're going to show the use of the RIS receiver using a terminal window as a command line application. On the sender side, we're going to show the RIS sender being used through a wrapper appliance, through a you know, fancy GUI, so to speak. All right, so the demo that follows, you know, the, the, now that I'm gonna get into, it's actually a 4K video desktop capture, right? Uh, I'm gonna be voicing, uh, you know, narrating what's happening, but the, the, the entire capture was already, you know, done. Uh, you might not be able to appreciate the quality of the 4K video through the Zoom window, so, you know, uh, we'll do our best. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start the video and narrate what's happening there. And I'm gonna go ahead and, all right. So let me start by describing what you see in this window. Can everybody see the video screen? Yeah, we see it. All right. So the video screen consists uh, right now of three components. Uh, the component on the left is a terminal window. Uh, there's multiple sub terminals on it. The one that's showing here now, it's just FFmpeg capturing the desktop and created the video that we're actually playing here today. Uh, the window on the right shows the, the GUI for what we call the Coral OS, and it's just a wrapper uh, for the RIS sender with a you know, nice looking interface. And the window right behind it on the left, it's a remote desktop that we'll use to enter and configure our network emulator appliance that sits between the sender and the receiver. All right, so let's go ahead and, and start the video. All right, so uh, first we start with a file. We have a open source publicly available 4K video from NASA. Uh, we set it on this device on a loop as the input, and then we move to the output setup of that file, and we create a transport stream uh, pointed to the local adapter on a specific port, uh, 9194. So all we're doing is putting a final and loop 4K file and pushing it to the local adapter. Now we go to the Libris configuration, we add a name and we put some notes since a lot of streams are set up to be 24 seven and we want to know what the link was about a month later when we come back to the GUI. So we have a nice comment area for it. Uh, then some of the uh, protocol options, we have uh, main, simple and advanced. And then we have the ability to create one or more uh, peer connections to other risk receivers and one or more UDP connections on the input in case you want to multiplex uh, multiple items, right? Uh, whenever we select more than one on the left hand side, we'll see more menu options that allows us to con uh, configure each of those separately. In the case of the, the demo, it's going to be just one input and one output, meaning one video is being ingested and uh, one peer link goes to the wrist receiver. This is a wrist sender. So in the wrist receiver, we enable the input uh, we listen to the unicast on the local adapter, which is where we're sending our NASA video. 
and we put, you know, listen to the, the correct port where our video is being picked up. Now we have a stream ID that uh, we introduce the concepts when we do the multiplexing and we have to make sure that matches the command line on the other side of the receiver and I'm highlighting what it would look like when you do a command line instead of a GUI. Either way is perfectly valid. Then on the uh, risk configuration itself, uh, we go ahead and define it with a name and then we specify the bandwidth. Why do we want a bandwidth? We want to make sure that we never, that we protect the link by having our own internal QoS. The maximum bandwidth has to match between the two endpoints and it has to be enough to pass your video, which is 30 megabits. Plus, we also put some overhead for spikes in bit rate, uh, retransmissions, etc. So on the sender, we go ahead and configure the remote IP uh, of the receiver, which is on the other terminal window. Uh, we specify a port. And uh, the other parameters here are standard encryption mode, key rotation, and a shared secret, which in this case, we're going to use the word secret in uppercase as our you know, secret passphrase to be shared among the units. So we had a lot of the complexity under the, the advanced section. I'm going to go through it right now. But this allows you to configure multiple links. Uh, when you have multiple links, you can do load balance, uh, primary backup or redundant, different weights. Uh, there's a lot of nuances in you know, different gateways for the different links for ISPs. Uh, protocol specific parameters, congestion control, uh, the canonical name, etc. session timeouts. It, it, it's all, you know, lets you fine tune everything on the protocol and so does the command line. You know, it's all different flags that you set up. The important ones though are the last three in this window. The reordering buffer. The reordering buffer is the amount of time we wait on the protocol before starting to send retransmissions. We're going to set it to 35 uh, to emulate a real world scenario. Here we see in uh, during this, this recording, the average ping time between Los Angeles and New York was 70 milliseconds, 68 or so. So we're gonna go ahead and set a reordering buffer to have that value of 35. And we see also the same parameters here, you know, on the command line as uh, I let it out there, buffer min and max. The buffer min and max is how much we're gonna use as our buffer. Libre supports dynamic buffering, meaning it's going to monitor the round trip type and uh, set up a buffer of six times that round trip type. In this case, we're going to go ahead and set up some boundaries for the min and max of the recovery buffer, make sure they match on both sender and receiver. And we're also going to send some boundaries for the retransmission intervals. The retransmission, uh, optimal retransmission is equal to the round trip time. But here we, we let the protocol itself auto adjust based on network conditions. We're gonna set it between 70 and 300 milliseconds, make sure that they're both the same. And uh, that's pretty much it. We have a, either a GUI or a command line configured uh, for a link that is gonna look like a cross country link. Uh, this is the emulator screen. Right now there's hardly any data. You see a few kilobits per second, just normal traffic from the network. And here's a GUI. The, the emulator lets us control the latency on either direction going you know, to and from uh, the two network ports. We have it set up as 35 milliseconds on each side, which pretty much is the uh, you know, same round trip as uh, the link. We start with a packet loss of 0.25% for this demo. On either direction, we add some uh, and, you know, data corruption, very little, and we also add some packet reordering which, you know, both of which are unlikely to occur, but we wanted to push this demo to the limit by adding reordering and packet corruption uh, in the link. So now we go ahead and uh, uh, look at the receiver and I think the next, then make sure everything matches and the next step is to start it. So we're going to, we just started the receiver command line and you can see the receivers waiting now for a connection. Now we got to go to the sender and we start the service and you see that immediately on the receiver the log goes crazy. Uh, the receiver is set up to debug mode so there's a lot of messages one for every packet yet you see it's only taking about 160 megs and one percent of the CPU on that particular machine which is I believe a, a, a small core i5 uh, to recover this packet. We started the playback on the receiver and this is a 4k video being transmitted. Uh, 
we see that at 0 0.25%, uh, the video is still perfect, there are no, and now we're just gonna go ahead and uh, start modifying the packet loss uh, in real time, and you can see the graph, we can see the video that it's still, you know, impeccable, no losses, no, no glitches. And in the emulator, you see on the, the right-hand side, lower right-hand side, the graph, the bandwidth graph now matches the data being transmitted. And as we make changes, you'll see glitches in the bandwidth graph, spikes, you know, jagged uh, functionalities, all representative. And in this case, they all, you know, emulate real world conditions or what happens when you're you know during a live broadcast and suddenly the network changes on you on the fly this is what this test is representing and we're looking at real time you know bandwidth spikes and retransmissions and in this case we are responsible for them as we're changing the settings you saw a little glitch on the screen right now that glitch comes from the packet corruption we added to the to the link uh, RIST uh, by itself does not recover from packet corruption. It's up to the implementer to put additional uh, retransmission mechanisms where the packet is corrupt. We don't have that here. And that's why you see that every now and then we, we see a, a malformed video screen. Uh, you can see uh, the, the log that just passed has had a ton of uh, messages going through. For every message, actually, we're actually, for every packet recovered, we're, we're printing a message. But overall, you see that, you know, the, the, the transmission is clean. Uh, we're going to see also as we increase the, the packet loss, what happens to the CPU and uh, RAM utilization. It hardly changes from our original 160 meg on the receiver and 1% CPU for a Core i5. And we are using, in this case, uh, AES encryption as well. So, you know, the, 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 the rest of, of the then what's going to be us increasing this all the way to 10%, uh, you know, step by step and looking at everything that, that happens, you know, in the settings, uh, monitoring memory, monitoring the bandwidth. Here's a log on the, on the sender side. Uh, every second, this thought is not in the bug mode, but every second we can see how many packets were sent and how many packets were retransmitted on that very second. You see in this case, 5,000 sent, 267 retransmitting during that one second interval. And in the receiver, unfortunately, the log is too verbose to look at the statistics on that one during this demo. But if you didn't have the verbose mode, you would see exactly the same thing. You know. The ability to monitor the link in real time and find out what's happening uh, you know, with your video, because visually your video will look perfect regardless, but it's nice to see if you're having some uh, conditions in your network and you need to go yell at somebody to find out who's taking all the bandwidth or who's, who's using the, 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 the network incorrectly while you're trying to do your transmission. So here's at 7.5. Uh, I hope you can appreciate the beauty of this uh, 4K video. Uh, you know, the, this is a nice one. The, you know, the, the logs, many thousands of messages per second being recovered by the receiver and at the same time, CPU and RAM is still, you know, negligible for this machine and for this video transmission. Uh, you can see here, it was still at 160 megs and 1%, it hasn't changed, even though our packet loss has increased significantly. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's remarkable. The, the last uh, part of the test will go all the way to 10 and leave it at that as uh, the last test, but we can go much higher. You know, it's, uh, it's not realistic as if you had something that, con that had continuous packet loss in both directions at 10%, you know, something must be on fire and you need to, you know, get out of the building anyway. So uh, that's uh, pretty much the demo. Uh, it shows you how to use the command line, how to use a GUI, how to monitor the, the, the different statistics. It shows you a real world scenario about transmission and, and the network and CPU resources required to perform some transmission. So lastly, we're gonna stop the sender. You're gonna see immediately the message on the receiver stop. We stop the receiver and we stop the recording. That's it. So now let me go back to the presentation for the last page. So, what have we learned? We, you can use the Libris tools directly or through your own GUI wrapper, like we showed there. That GUI wrapper is an, actually an Amazon machine or a VM that we actually provide uh, uh, for free if people want to try out RIST. 
uh, uh, RIST is reliable on their heavy packet loss. We also learned that. Uh, and we realized it will be easy to have a combination of ingrown solutions that interoperate properly with vendor provider appliance thanks to uh, publicly available open source projects that have RIST and you know, any vendor's implementation of RIST which follows the standards. So any questions that are not answered here, you know, please do not hesitate to contact us. And uh, you know, that's it, I'll, I'll open, uh, uh, thank you very much and I'll open the questions. Okay, very good, thank you. Right now we don't have any questions, but I would just ask of all the things that you showed in that presentation, um, those tools, are those all open source, a mix of open source and the, the uh, tools, okay, what are they? Okay, the terminal tools, they're all open source, 100%. You can get them from the Librist uh, repository, compile them or download binaries and use them. The GUI tools, they're not open source, they're part of the Sibradius product line, but we do provide free versions of those virtual machines uh, with functionality for you to receive and send RIST on it. You know, beyond that, of course, you know, it's a different issue, but we do provide for people that wanna play with the GUIs and AWS and Azure and they own virtual machines. We provide these virtual machines for them to use for free. And the virtual machines use the same tools without any modifications. We don't have a special flavor in our machines and a different open source. It's the exact same one. We maintain both of them. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that. Sergio, great to see you. Hope we uh, actually are seeing each other face to face for real uh, at some time when it's appropriate. Thank you so much. So an anonymous attendee asks, so the stream is AES encrypted, but it's up to the implementers to do the key exchange with an asymmetric method like RSA? Correct. The, the protocol itself doesn't specify how you're supposed to exchange that secret passphrase. You know, you can put it in a pigeon and uh, you can uh, send a secret message, some, you know, however you want to do it. The protocol say, it says there's a secret passphrase they, most, they both most have. You figure out a secure way to transmit it between the two. 